In the 1900s, football was unified, but also it wasn't. Charles Brownlow, yes, the medal guy, and John Worrell had moved to form the AFC, the Australian Football Council, with our old friend HCA Harrison becoming its first chair. This was a central national body that would not only undergo entirely too many name changes, but serve the purpose the VFA was invented for. Control of the national rule set, as well as being the arbiter of interstate player transfers and organising national tournaments. Each state had two delegates, as well as New Zealand, to represent its main league. There were two exceptions. WA, which had one delegate for each of its big leagues, and Victoria, which had two leagues, but one of them wasn't allowed to eat at the big boys' table. The VFA had actually brought this on themselves, thanks to contributing to the dissolution of the informal version of the AFC that had existed in the 1880s and 1890s by basically saying nuh-uh to their permit decisions and rule set changes. Legal disputes aside, put simply, football was unified everywhere except here. This is the tale of the Victorian Football War that ravaged from 1907 to 1925. The VFL had eight teams in 1907. Its main rival, the VFA, had ten. And sure, on average, the VFL teams were richer, closer to the city, and just a little bit better than the VFA sides, but an eight-team league was a little sad. To truly be the Alpha League, you couldn't have less teams than the guys you were trying to beat. So the VFL went looking for team number nine. Melbourne University's football team had a weird history. One of the oldest teams still existing. Loyal Gasman viewers might remember them as the first opponent of St Kilda. No, not that one. And for their brief flirtation with St Kilda, yes, that one. Of course, recent viewers will remember them as the team that jerked Melbourne around because they didn't want to give up the Challenge Cup. They'd also played in the VFA very, very briefly and were now dominating the VFA's junior association, being viewed as one of the better non-senior teams in Victoria. And on the 4th of October 1907, the VFL admitted university to its ranks and resolved to add a 10th team to avoid the issue of a bye, issuing out a tender knowing full well that there were VFA teams that secretly wanted to join the VFL. Even one team leaving would assert the VFL's superior status. In the end, three teams applied to be Team 10. No, not that one. North Melbourne is my city, am I right? Richmond, Brighton, who'd finished second in Universities League, and an amalgamation between North Melbourne and West Melbourne. North were terrible on field, while 1906 Premiers West were bankrupt. And thanks to Essendon choosing University as its preferred co-tenant instead of West, they were homeless. The proposed merger was conditional on acceptance to the VFL, but the VFL had adopted a strategy in which they take all the inner city teams, leaving the suburban sides for the VFA. Richmond, based on almost a literal stone's throw from the MCG, well, they fit the bill perfectly. So sadly, the northwest of the world would get belonged to a bloke called Kanye. Actually, does is he still got the parenting rights to that kid? I don't know. We're not E Entertainment. We're not TMZ. Fuck it. The VFA was pissed at North going behind their back, and so they were thrown out of the association. Northcote replaced them, and replacing Richmond was Brighton. Interesting. North and a rapidly dying West reapplied to the VFL in February as an 11th team called City Football Team, but were turned down. They then reapplied for the VFA and again were turned down. A month later, both clubs were dead. On the 15th of April, a new North Melbourne Football Club was formed that somehow still technically counted as the old club and gained admittance for the VFA on the condition that the prior board members of the North and West sides were not involved and they swore a pledge of loyalty to the league and I'm sure that will last a long time. And you probably already experienced foreshadowing. West Melbourne also left further ripples in the rivalry between the leagues. West ground sharing with Essendon was a bad look for the VFL, and so they banned VFA clubs from all of their grounds. West was resuscitated briefly, called City of Melbourne, and then tried to enter the VFA the next year, but that failed. Another merger with North failed, and then they died and never haunted anyone again, aside from those awful North tribute kits. Oh, 
Mm. Gladly, more weird shit happened. North had their score wiped after a head count, but still won. Uh, Big Dave McNamara, good to see you again, mate. Mr. McNamara, Mr. Dave McNamara. Had an after-the-siren shot in a final interrupted by pitch invaders before becoming the golden god of footy goal kicking. And I'm wanting to make a full video on Dave later on, let me know if you're interested. He turned the dreadnoughts, what a cool fucking name, into a powerhouse. While North and Brunswick were fighting over who would lose to them in the final, they drew their first semi-final, necessitating a replay the next week, which was also drawn. North won the only ever second replay of a final. Meanwhile, Preston and Northcote merged after being too terrible for the VFA to bear. The VFA wanted payback on the VFL and tried to expand into their eastern stronghold with a team called Melbourne City taking the 10th... Oh god, they're back! Well, I'm not actually sure that they're back. They played at the East Melbourne Cricket Ground which stood here before it stopped standing here. Not much exists on this version of City as they lasted from 1912 all the way to 1913. They played 36 games, lost all of them, including one where they had 13 more scoring shots than the opponent, which is just amazing. And then they quietly faded away, making St Kilda look like 1920s Collingwood. They were replaced with another Eastern team called Hawthorne. Never heard of them. Also, the VFA began a trend of trying to be really different to gain attention, first by culling on-field player numbers to 17 and later 16, and then inverting the percentage system, which meant that one win 1914 Northcote had a percentage of 208. These changes were small and didn't last, but they weren't going to throw this different approach away. That's terrible foreshadowing. Foreshadowing as a narrative device. Uh, they also permanently introduced numbers on the back of Guernseys in either 1907 or 1912, depending on what you read, which Port Melbourne had actually begun doing in 1905, becoming the first recorded team to do so. Meanwhile, in the VFL, the game had fundamentally broken. Thanks to the VFL ruling in the 1890s, all players were still strictly amateur. This meant two things. Firstly, that clubs did pay star players and listed it in their reports as merely expenses, as we've already established. It also meant that the gambling industry, already made huge by the popularity of horse racing, could entice some players with large bribes to play poorly. This was prevalent in the early 1910s in particular, with tons of incidents in both the VFL and the VFA, as well as country footy and even the Premier League in England. But the highest profile incident in Australia was when the VFL suspended two Carlton players for life, eventually reduced to 99 game sentences for allegedly taking bribes to play poorly before the semi-final in 1910. The VFL, in a decision unpopular with sports writers at the time, legalised player payments for 1911 to try and curb this raft of bribery. The age of professionalism was dawning. Then the war came, with the VFA going into recess for two years, returning in 1918. Now, history buffs may realise that the First World War was still on in 1918, but the VFA returned for a very good reason. Another up yours to the VFL. The VFA and VFL didn't recognise most, if not all, player transfers between the leagues. This stung Dave McNamara. Mr. McNamara, Mr. Dave McNamara. When he tried to return to his Saints, apparently spooked by either winning actual premierships or that his team was called the Dreadnoughts again. What a cool fucking name. Actually, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. I just want to interject to talk about the permit process and how insane it was using Big Dave as an example. Firstly, he had to obtain a clearance to move from his own team. Luckily, being a star player and a mid-season signing back in 1909, he'd been able to work a gentleman's agreement into his deal that the Dreadnoughts only slightly got in the way of. That done, he had to apply for and get a permit from the VFA to leave it. Then he'd have to apply for and get a different but functionally identical permit from the VFL to enter that league. 
after that, he'd then have to go to the club of his choice, St Kilda, in person to complete yet another set of forms, and all of this was before the invention of the biro pen. What a pain in the ass, or rather, wrist. His process took over a year, even with due cause to leave, because the VFA simply blocked his transfer request for no stated reason. So a lot of players typically just left without permission from the league they were already in. Players who transferred did so without approval from the league they were leaving, which meant that they were banned from returning to that league typically for about three years. But the leagues had signed an agreement to validate all transfers during the Great War, ironically signing a treaty while millions were dying. This agreement expired on the 1st of June 1918, putting the VFA in danger of losing players who wouldn't be allowed to come back, as most of their players were playing VFL footy during the war, which of course that league was still running, unlike the VFA. So six clubs came back in 1918 to play a shortened season solely to spite the VFL. The league soon returned to normal numbers and normal weirdness. North had to play a semi-final replay because, again, a crowd invasion stopped the kick after the siren to win a game. North lost the chance to win that game and the replay with the team that beat them winning the flag. LOL. And then all hell broke loose. 1921, Essendon, the VFL flavour, lost their ground to a rail yard development and instead of playing in Essendon, decided to move to North Melbourne for 1922. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's already a North Melbourne and, hey, they're actually pretty good now having just won 49 games in a row and they super, 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 super duper extra promise with sugar on top that they wouldn't leave the VFA. But here they are, pulling out of the VFA halfway through 1921 to have a chance of playing VFL football in Essendon colours before making any sort of agreement with Essendon Mind. North, now defunct, were banned again from the VFA, who then protested over Essendon moving into their turf and replacing the only central Melbourne team they had left, which would nuke gate receipt totals. David O'Man, Minister for Lands, ruled in the favour of the VFA. Essendon were now homeless again. North were now teamless again, and the VFA were down to nine teams. But logic prevailed with Essendon playing in Essendon and North being allowed back into the association, presumably making more promises to be loyal, while they had their fingers crossed behind their back. Funnily enough, the club that finished right below a North side that hadn't existed as an entity for ten games was the Essendon Dreadnoughts. Hang on, they play in Essendon. There's already an Essendon. Oh dear. The Dreadnoughts disbanded and ended up amalgamating with North, funnily enough, to create a unified entity for 2022. This left the VFA down a team, but gave them an opportunity to admit a club that doesn't share a name in a future ground with a VFL team. Oh. Oh dear. Geelong, brackets, A dot, close brackets, joined for 1922, which is actually a good move for the VFA. They just had their first major victory over the VFL in the Battle of Essendon and were now dipping toes into the regional market, clawing back VFL's massive market share in Victoria's biggest shanty town. Sorry, Geelong, no offence. Actually, mm, yeah, no, it's better than Bendigo. The VFL itself, well, it had its own problems. Yes, they kept the lights on during the war, but most of those seasons were farcical, especially Fitzroy winning from last in 1916 in a 14 league. Plus, they lost University before the Great War even started. University were doomed from the outset, as the strictly amateur club entered the league in a time where player payments were becoming the norm. The only player of quality to pass through was Roy Park, the VFL's 1915 leading goal scorer in a winless side. But the team with a win percentage of 215, the worst the VFL would ever see, had served their true purpose, destabilizing the VFA. And now, after all the Great War stuff had settled down, their absence became another prime opportunity to cripple the VFA. The VFL now only had nine teams, but both the VFL and VFA had their fair share of wannabes queuing at the door, with the VFA knocking back Camberwell, Coburg and Geelong West, and the VFL showing the velvet rope to three VFA clubs who this time faced no consequences for their treachery. 
In response, the leagues agreed to ban transfers that didn't have approval from both the players' club and the league, deepening the divide between the two. And in 1924, well, things get crazy. It started with public servants, like a team of them. The Public Service Football Club formed in 1924 and made an approach to the VFL to join their league, which had become semi-professional by this point. It was a weird choice of team to admit, but the VFL didn't really care about the team itself. It cared about where they played. The Amateur Sports Ground, ironically named for a professionalising league, was a huge facility, centrally located and with an expansion potential that may have rivaled the MCG. It was located where the fantastically boringly named geodesic dome looking disaster called the Melbourne Rectangular Stadium stands today. It was a high quality turf oval ringed by a concrete third of a mile oval track with a ridiculous 46 degrees of banking with a 32,000 seat capacity. This was comfortably the second biggest stadium in Melbourne at the time and the fight for the right to party there, well it was insane. The VFL was keen to keep other sports and those VFA losers away and so public servants sparked the VFA search to admit a tenth team and possibly even more. Footscray were one of the 1922 VFL applicants and had just beaten 1924 VFL Premier's Essendon in a charity match. I guess Footscray were used to beating teams with that name by now. Actually, there were allegations by the Essendon coach that the match had been fixed, presumably because the VFL thought that its crappy little brother couldn't produce good enough teams to beat them legitimately. Either way, Footscray would be a great jewel in the VFL's crown, but there were a few problems. They didn't have a great stadium, firstly, but secondly, ten years before, the VFL had introduced zone-based recruiting. Admitting Footscray would bite into huge chunks of Essendon's and South's recruiting zones. As public service would instead be made of well, public servants, they didn't necessarily pose a threat to these established zones. And finally, thanks to that 1923 transfer agreement, the VFA was highly unlikely to give transfers to the Footscray team. Sure, the VFL would get a club with nine VFA flags, but it would be a shell with no players, nothing in it. It was a lot to think about. Too much, in fact. Ironically, public servants got sick of waiting too long for someone to make a decision and cancelled their approach to the VFL, turning to the VFA instead in November. It seemed their owners, Melbourne Carnivals, had a big master plan. They planned on installing floodlights at the amateur sports ground, hosting night games and establishing two more clubs to play there as well, Richmond City and Melbourne City. Oh no, not again. They would also bankroll these clubs, allowing them to pay £5 per player per week. Enormous wages for the time. This crazy big deal never happened, but just getting that facility would be enough. This looked to be a huge slam dunk for the association until Melbourne Carnivals were the ones who got sick of waiting and upgraded their motorcycle track instead. They ended up relenting a bit and gave the ground to the VFA for their final series, but not to public servants. Without a field to play on, public servants withdrew from the VFA without playing a game. So it looked like the VFL would remain at nine teams and the exchange would be a stalemate, if not a slight VFA win. Then the VFA got the biggest gun it could get its hands on, carefully aimed it at both of their feet and wailed on the trigger. The VFA admitted Coburg, a VFL reserves club, as one of its new clubs, trying to expand to 12. The VFL saw this as a breaking of their 1923 permit agreement, either because it was a VFL affiliate that was pinched, or that the change in team numbers meant that the VFL's constitution had changed. Either way, their deal was voided, and the VFL sought to destroy their bitter rival once and for all. Admitting one team would unfairly hurt the recruiting zones of a couple of teams, so the VFL decided to admit three teams and redraw all of the recruitment zones. And so it was. Footscray with a major draw card, North Melbourne also predictably threw their hat into the ring and on their fourth application to the VFL they were finally successful with David O'Man making the VFA say oh man by reversing his 1921 decision and allowing North to use Arden Street in the VFL. The VFL then also picked Hawthorne, likely due to their location 
to be Team 12. These three teams had won 17 premierships in the 28 years since the split, with a further 14 runners-up appearances. But while I say these three, Hawthorne's only contribution to the VFA is a very funny story that I must tell you. Bill Walton was a premiership player for Collingwood. Having joined the VFL after the VFA went into recess, he returned to Port Melbourne right after his 1919 flag, but for the 1922 season, he got an offer to be captain coach of Hawthorne. However, Port Melbourne didn't want to lose their on-field leader and 1914 leading goal scorer and refused to clear his transfer. In 1922, Bill Walton did indeed coach Hawthorne, but while playing for Port Melbourne. This all meant he played against the team he coached twice, the only time it's ever happened in the VFA or VFL. According to one source, in one of those matches, a Port Melbourne player had to be restrained from hitting Walton, infuriated by Walton's encouragement of Hawthorne. He won Port Melbourne a flag in 1922 and was cleared to go to Hawthorne outright after that. Fascinating, utterly, utterly fascinating. But anyway, the VFL has 12 teams, most of which are in Melbourne's heartland, all of which having won a grand final in their respective leagues except for Tweedledee and Tweedle fucking idiot over here. Meanwhile, the VFA has seven teams, most of which are on the outskirts of the metro area, with a sum total of six senior level flags between them. The VFA sign up Preston and multi-time applicant into VFA, Camberwell, to help boost the league to 10, but the damage is done. If it means anything, Coburg, the team that helped destroy the VFA by joining them, won three of the first four premierships available to them, and then failed to win a flag for 50 years. Most recently, they were Richmond's reserve side at a time when they were forced to field Relton Roberts, Ben Nason, and Jared Oakley Nichols. It seems the Dreadnoughts had a far less cruel fate in simply dying. The VFL's sole goal in the 1924 poaching was to weaken the VFA as much as possible. The VFA's move to sign Coburg seemed based on public servants being a certainty, bringing riches and facilities. In the end, it proved to be their downfall. Or, so it seemed. You see, for a while it looked like the Tyrannosaurus Rex was the king of the world, but it was the cave-dwelling mammals that survived the meteor. Take that, you tiny-armed prick. And sure enough, another meteor was coming. And this one was going to give the VFA another shot at supremacy. But before I tell that story, I've got to go off on a tangent. You see, we almost never got here at all. Remember 1847, when rugby and Aussie rules were basically the same mishmash of ideas? Well, in 1914, some mad lads thought, what if that, but again... Probably with smarter words, though. Uh, next time, I'm going to introduce you to the ultimate Aussie sport that no one remembers, and a sport that technically was never actually played. Universal football.